Chapter 10 6.15 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time The Skies Over the Atlantic Ocean The small blue jet with the U.S. Department of State logo streaked north and east across the sky, dark water below them. Inside the plane, Luke and his new team moved tentatively toward working together for the first time. They used the front four passenger seats as their meeting area. They stowed their luggage and their gear in the seats at the back. Luke glanced around. This was the young team. They looked like some kind of youth group going for their first overnight. Trudy Wellington sat directly across from Luke, occasionally tossing her curly brown hair out of her face. She was slim and attractive, in a green sweatshirt and blue jeans. Her blue eyes hid behind her big, red-rimmed owl glasses. Across from Luke and to the left, facing him, was Mark Swan. He stretched his long bird legs out into the aisle. An old pair of ripped jeans and a pair of red Chuck Taylor sneakers there for anyone to trip over. His aviator glasses were tinted yellow. He wore a black Ramones t-shirt, covered by a red flannel shirt. In the seat next to Luke sat Ed Newsom. His jacket was off now, demonstrating his rippling upper body. He was steely-eyed, huge, a bear of a man. He wore a precisely trimmed beard, his hair shaved to the skin on the sides with about an inch on top. Both his beard and his hair were jet black. All three of these people were staring hard at Luke. None of them looked friendly. Trudy and Swan seemed edgy, skittish almost, as though their lack of confidence in Luke made them nervous. Newsom didn't seem nervous at all. He sat back in his seat as though he might fall asleep at any moment. So what's the story, boss man, he said. Luke smiled. He and this big kid were going to get tangled up. He could see that already. Boss man, huh? Would you prefer if I call you Hot Rod? Newsom said. Why don't you call me Luke? Or you can also try Mr. Stone. Newsom grunted at that. Luke glanced out his window. It was a bright day, but the sun was already behind them. In a little while, as they moved further east, the sky would begin to darken. Iraq was a long way, so far that they'd have to stop in Germany to refuel. Trudy? She nodded, her eyes going wider than before. Luke had suddenly thrust her on stage. Yes? You're the intelligence officer, right? Yes. Luke shrugged. Well, we all know something about this case, but you probably know the most. I imagine you have some paperwork on all this, don't you? She nodded again. Of course, sure. Why don't you fill us in? There was a thick file folder on the seat next to her. She picked it up and opened it. On one side was a slim three-ring binder, on the other side was a sleeve holding loose documents. She opened the binder several pages from the beginning. Okay, she said. I'm going to assume that none of you have any prior knowledge of the events, the people involved, or the strategies we plan to take. Sounds good to me, Luke said. Boys? Good, Swan said. Let's hear it, Ed said. He eased back into his seat. It's a lot of information, Trudy said. It might take a little while. Luke shrugged. It's a long flight, he said. We've got all the time of the world. He listened for a bit as she went through her paperwork, describing for the others and for Luke the past and present of Edwin Lee Parr. Gradually, Luke drifted. He thought of Rebecca, alone at her family's country house, waiting for him to return. He could picture her standing on the back patio, framed by the sunset, her belly large with their child. He wanted, more than anything, for this trip to happen fast. He knew that, past the eighth month, that baby could come any time. Due dates were more like suggestions or guidelines than a hard and fast schedule. 
He thought of her eating dinner at her parents' big stone house in the Virginia suburbs. Maybe sleeping over. Probably sleeping over. Her parents were wealthy. And as far as Luke knew, had never worked a day in their lives. They didn't think much of Luke. He knew. Elite special operations units did not impress them. People who joined the military were a different class of people from them, from their daughter, from their grandchild. He wasn't sure what worried them more. That he would die during a deployment? Or that he would come home alive? Luke? Trudy had said. Yeah, I'm sorry. What was that again? Beside him, Ed Newsom released a sort of sneering laugh. Do you want me to go over the operation plan? She said. Sure, let's hear it. She riffled through some papers. She pointed at him. Luke, your name is Edward King. They made your identity easy to remember. You're 32 years old, the same age you are now. You were in the 75th Army Rangers, which you were, in fact, in. You used to work for Blackstone Corporation, and that's how you came to be in Iraq. But they fired you for insubordination. Now you're on your own, looking to make a score. She turned to Newsom. Ed, your name is David Dell. People call you D.D. Also easy to remember. You're 25 years old, and you were once in the 87th Airborne. You also worked for Blackstone. But your contract was not renewed. You and Ed King are now partners. Okay, Newsom said. That's fine. But how do the big guy and I infiltrate? Big guy. Newsom was trying to be a comedian. Luke didn't like comedians. Easy enough, Trudy said. There's an informant. I don't have his identity because that's protected information. He was detained and arrested by a squad of Marines at a checkpoint outside of the city of Fallujah. He was riding in a Range Rover with three young Iraqi women. It wasn't clear how an American came to be riding with three Iraqi women, but they were apparently in some distress. What little understanding I have of the situation is that the girls were teenagers, and he may have bought them, from their families or possibly from someone else, for a nominal amount of money. He's a pimp, Newsom said. Trudy was noncommittal. I don't have any information on what he was doing or intended to do, All we know is, whoever he is, he was with Parr up until very recently. He is now in the custody of the CIA and has been interrogated by Bill Cronin. Luke inwardly winced at the idea of someone being interrogated by Bill Cronin. The guy who got picked up probably had a rough night with Bill. Well, good for him. People like Bill Cronin existed for a reason. And they didn't come to see you unless you had strayed way off the path. He is a cooperating witness now, Trudy said, telling Luke something he already knew. Men in the custody of Big Daddy Cronin were invariably cooperating witnesses. If they were still alive, they were eager to cooperate. He is on Parr's team, and the plan is that he will take you back into Sunni-controlled territory and lead you directly to Parr. How long has he been in custody? Luke said. She referred to a sheet of paper. Um, approximately 72 hours, as of this moment. By the time he leads you back to Parr's hideout, figure more like four days. So they're going to be suspicious of him, Luke said. She nodded. Probably. The story goes that he was picked up by a patrol, spent a few days in jail, then was released with the two of you. Ed Newsom shook his head. That story is going to last exactly... It only needs to last long enough to get you to Parr's hideout and in the door, Trudy said. Then what? Newsom said. Then you arrest him. Newsom stared at her, the faintest echo of a grin on his face. But he didn't say anything. Luke silently commended him for that. When Trudy had first pitched Luke the idea for this mission, he hadn't been able to keep quiet about it. All three of you are going to be wearing GPS units, Mark Swan said. 
The car you ride in will have a strobing transponder embedded on the roof. It'll be visible from the sky by our guys, but not on the ground by Parr's guys. Unless he has command of a satellite or a drone, Newsom said. Swan shook his head. I highly doubt it. The guy has gone all the way outlaw. The U.S. military controls those skies. Parr is trying to stay invisible. He's not flying anything. Two Black Hawks with Ranger squads on each are going to be trailing you, Trudy continued. Also, if need be, there will be an Apache gunship on call. You can call in reinforcements or a heavy airstrike at any time. So the whole game, Luke began. She nodded. Yes. You're following the informant down the rabbit hole and confirming that he has led you to Parr. Once in Parr's presence, you make the positive ID on him. At that point, Parr can surrender to you, or he can die. The choice will be his to make. And we're dangled there in front of him like fresh meat, Newsom said. Well, not in so many words, Trudy said. But, yes, Mark Swan said. Chapter 11, May 6th. 11.05 a.m. Arabian Standard Time. 4.05 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The Embassy of the United States in Iraq, a.k.a. the Republican Palace. The International Zone, a.k.a. the Green Zone. Kark District, Baghdad, Iraq. How was the trip in from the airport, Big Daddy Bill Cronin said. He was a bear of a man, tall, with a thick body, big shoulders and arms, and a bushy red beard, maybe softening now and going a bit gray. Luke had known Big Daddy for a few years. Two years ago, Big Daddy had been his CIA handler when Luke went deep undercover here in Iraq. Fine, Luke said. And it had been fine, if fine meant riding at high speed in a convoy of armored Humvees each one with passengers packed in like sardines, heavily armed soldiers hanging out the windows, aiming their guns at anything and everything every inch of the way, and screaming curses in Arabic at any and all human beings they passed. The convoy didn't take any enemy fire on the trip, and that was fine. And the landing, how was that? The pilot stuck the landing, to coin a phrase, Luke said. A few people puked, but we came in safe and sound. The second leg of their trip had been a flight from Germany aboard a medium-sized passenger jet. The plane had come down to the Baghdad airport in corkscrew fashion, banking hard left and dropping fast the entire way to thwart any rocket attacks from the ground. When the plane hit the runway, the pilots braked hard, bringing the plane to an abrupt stop. Very nice, Bill Cronin said. He looked at the rest of Luke's crew. Did you guys enjoy your first Baghdad special? I was one of the people who puked, Trudy said. So was I, Swan said. Cronin smiled. It's a rite of passage. I've done it a couple of times myself. He looked at Big Ed Newsom. You? Newsom shook his head and smiled. I don't puke, man. Cronin shook his head. You don't know what you're missing, buddy. Bill Cronin wore khaki slacks, shiny black shoes, and an open-throated dress shirt, which at this time of the morning was beginning to soak through with sweat. There was no air conditioning in Saddam Hussein's former Republican palace. He walked briskly, leading them down a series of wide marble hallways, all of them teeming with people. Crowds of people zigged and zagged, squeezing past each other in each direction. People sat in wheeled office chairs at makeshift desks pushed up against the stone walls, typing into computer keyboards or jabbering into telephones, their voices echoing off the twenty-foot-high rounded and tiled ceilings. Wires snaked across the floors or ran along the walls, bundled with heavy black duct tape. 
People in various stages of sweaty undress tried to catch a few minutes or hours of sleep on military-issue cots, the cots lining stretches of hallway in single file, like ants. Here and there, areas were sectioned off with plywood. Some hung with canvas drapes or tarps, making instant offices or maybe bedrooms. The plywood boards were spray-painted with a series of letters and numbers. Luke was tired from the trip, but he figured the designations would make sense to him if he stopped for a moment to think about them. A couple of the plywood walls were adorned with American flags. The old place is looking good, Luke said, like Calcutta. He had spent several days here in an earlier time, soon after the building had been abandoned and then looted. In those days, barely anyone was here. There was no electricity, and a handful of international troops held the approaches against all comers. The area that had coalesced into the Green Zone had once been the wealthiest neighborhood in Baghdad. Saddam had lived here in the Republican Palace, of course, but the whole district had been filled with mansions of varying sizes, upscale apartment houses, fashionable restaurants and shops. When the American invasion came and the bombing started, the residents all left with whatever they could carry. When Luke first arrived in Baghdad in 2003, few people understood that all these places were up for grabs. You could move right in on a first-come, first-served basis if you had the right mindset and the firepower to protect yourself. Combat units on patrol took over several of the mansions. A couple of units even took the palace. Since it was among the easier places to fortify and protect, within short order it became the bizarre, grandiose, and yet rudimentary and rustic headquarters of the coalition provisional government. No electricity, no air conditioning, no running water, portable lights only, and nearly constant mortar attacks. It looked like things had settled down some since then. Big Daddy shrugged and shook his head. It's gotten crowded, for sure. What can I say? It's the safest place in town. Almost nobody can get into the green zone who doesn't belong here. Fanatics smuggle a bomb or a grenade in once in a while, and people still blow themselves up at the checkpoints on a regular basis. But if you don't happen to be standing outside the gates when it happens, then you're fine. We still take mortar fire sometimes but it usually doesn't reach, and the walls are ten feet thick anyway. Also, the swimming pool in the back has water in it now, and it's open for business. Everybody wants to be here, and never mind the crowds. They passed a gaggle of people taking notes as a tall, jarhead captain lectured them about something or other. I've got a conference room reserved up ahead here, so we should be fine, Bill said. We can get away from all this noise. He turned down a short, narrow corridor. At the end was a heavy wooden door, which he opened without a key. The room was dimly lit by battery-operated lamps setting at a table made from a thick wood slab sitting on two sawhorses. There were no windows. Instead, the walls were covered in a tiled mosaic showing a desert oasis scene possibly from a time of the dawn of civilization. Two men sat at the table. Both stood when Bill Cronin, Luke, and the team came in. The first, a tall man with close-cropped gray hair, stood ramrod straight in a United States Army camouflage uniform with no identifying marks. Luke knew right away what that meant. The second man was smaller, younger, with sandy hair, a haggard, doughy face, and a bit of a paunch. His skin was pale, despite being in the middle of a desert. He looked like he didn't get outside much. He was smoking a cigarette and sweating profusely. The climate didn't seem to agree with him. Agent Luke Stone, this is Colonel Radis of Joint Special Operations Command. This is Mr. Montgomery from the British Embassy. Cronin made a funny bird's feet gesture with his fingers when he said the words British Embassy. Luke also knew what that meant. The man didn't work for the British Embassy. 
He introduced his young team to the two men. Won't you all sit down? Colonel Radis said. We've got water for everyone. Luke and his group sat. Bill Cronin remained standing. Eight or nine generic plastic bottles of water were on the table in front of them. Trudy and Swan reached for bottles. Ed Newsom was apparently too cool for that. Luke reached and took one. We know you just came in, and you must be eager to get to your accommodations. So we'll go through this as quickly as we can, Radis said. I think we know most of the details of the operation, Luke said. Trudy received a great deal of information before we left, and she briefed us on the flight. Radis nodded. Good. We've got some classified material here that may not have been transmitted to you because of its delicate nature. The fewer eyes with the opportunity to see this information, the better. And I believe it will increase your understanding of the situation. Okay, Luke said. Hit us. Montgomery put a series of photographs on the table in a row, one at a time. Luke picked one up, glanced at it, and handed it to Trudy. Then he picked up another one. They were photos of abandoned palaces, similar in nature to the one they were in, but in worse shape. Walls were pockmarked with bullet holes, or half destroyed by mortar fire. Fixtures were ripped out and missing. Trashed furniture and equipment lay heaped in piles. Pyramid-shaped rock slides of rubble lay against ruined walls. Burnt-out skeletons of trucks and cars sat side by side in parking lots. In one photo, a bust of Saddam Hussein wore a medieval equestrian combat helmet on his head, as though Saddam had been a horseback warrior during the Golden Age of Islam. Luke smiled at that one. Saddam looked like a child playing make-believe. As you may know, Saddam was in power here for nearly twenty-four years, Montgomery said. He spoke with a clipped upper-crust English accent. He had an oddly high-pitched voice. He seemed like an odd man in many ways. Spooks often were. And during that time, he built between eighty and one hundred palaces for his own private use, as well as the use of his family, bath party officials, friends and business partners of his, and his many mistresses. He wasn't shy about looting Iraq's treasury, stockpiling priceless antiquities looted from his own country— from Iran during the war in the early 1980s, and from Kuwait during his occupation there in 1990. Unmarked cash, much of it in American dollars, cars, gold, diamonds, anything you can imagine. He moved much of this hoard to banks outside the country, but some of it is still right here, hidden in his palaces, but also in old weapons depots, in underground bunkers, and caves. We believe the value of his secret fortune runs into the many billions of dollars. Indeed, Saddam was probably one of the richest men on earth. And this widely known fact is classified because why? Ed Newsom said. Montgomery raised an index finger. It isn't as widely known as you may believe. There are hundreds of thousands of troops... American and coalition, not to mention reporters, aid workers, and international observers tramping through this country right now. There are millions of Iraqis, many of them in unsanctioned militias. If everyone knew the size of this fortune, the war would become more of a free-for-all money hunt than it is currently. Wouldn't want that, Newsom said, would we? Our soldiers have a mission here, Radis said and it isn't looting and grabbing. Ed smiled his arrogant young smile. His teeth gleamed white. No? What is it, then? Show them the other pictures. Montgomery came out with a new pile of photographs. He placed these on the table one by one in a grid, as he had done with the others. Luke picked up the first of these and winced. It showed what looked like a five-year-old girl ripped apart by machine gun fire. These are disturbing, Colonel Radis said. The next one showed a pile of bodies, women and children, their robes soaked with blood. 
The wall behind them was pockmarked, as though it was being used by a firing squad. We believe this is the work of Parr and his group, Montgomery said. All of these photos were taken in the past few days. Why is he doing this? Luke said. Edwin Lee Parr has gone insane, Radis said. Clearly insane, Mark Swan said. He was looking at the photos from behind his hand. His fingers opened half an inch. Parr and his group have been working with Sunni informants, some of whom were former officials in Saddam's regime, and some of whom were in the Iraqi military. This is how he's been so successful in discovering Saddam's hidden treasure. Our intelligence suggests that Parr and his group currently have hundreds of millions in American dollars alone in their possession, and possibly hundreds of millions more in gold and silver bars and diamonds. The local people are now well aware of what he's doing and what he has. Parr is trapped in the Sunni Triangle, with no way out of the country. But the country is awash in weaponry, and Parr has obtained his share of it. With no way out, he is holding his own and maintaining control by increasingly harsh means. He has been targeting women and children, especially the women and children of local elders who stand up to him. More and more, he is taking the women hostage and using them as human shields. Luke felt his heart sink. This was supposed to be an arrest. He was the police now. But he had a young partner who showed him no respect. And the man he was supposed to arrest was a psychotic committing atrocities against a civilian population. Terrific. We are concerned that Parr is going to attempt to run for the Syrian border. What good will that do? Luke said. If he makes it that far, it's possible that corrupt border guards and the Syrian military will accept payoffs from him and smuggle him and his men to the Turkish border. Perhaps they can obtain new identities along the way. If they make it to Turkey with some of their millions and with new identities, then they might as well be in Europe at that point. Luke looked at Bill. What are the chances of that happening? Bill shrugged. He's been pretty good so far. My guess is he could make it but it would take a lot of bloodletting to pull it off. How many human shields does he have? Ed Newsom said. It seemed like the first serious comment or question he had made since Luke met him. We think probably at least fifty, Montgomery said. And he will certainly kill all of them if he has to. He's desperate. He's shown no compunction about killing. And if anything, he seems to have, shall we say, an increasing appetite for it. So what's next? Luke said. You guys get some rest and some decent food in your stomachs, Radis said. We'll get our informant cleaned up a bit. That will probably take a few hours. He's had a couple of long question-and-answer sessions he's sleeping off. Luke glanced at Bill again. Big Daddy made a face to indicate disapproval, or possibly disgust. Big Daddy was known as an unpleasant interrogator. Among that group, most were dispassionate, almost like scientists carrying out experiments on rodents. In Luke's experience, Bill seemed to take an active dislike of his subjects. The more he hurt them, the more he started to hate them. The informant believes he knows exactly where Pa is, Montgomery said. That was another fact we didn't want to transmit— Tomorrow morning, before first light, we would like you gentlemen to go in there. Arrest Parr, Luke said. Big Daddy did a small head shake. If he'll see reason, Radis said. Sure, arrest him if you like. We'll take it from there. Briefly, Luke thought of the CIA black site that existed at Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan. Something told him that the justice Parr was going to see wasn't going to involve a judge and jury back in the United States. Edwin Lee Parr is beyond reason, Montgomery said. Trudy Wellington riffled through some papers on the desk. 
The man we're about to see is Davis Cole, 36 years old, ex-Marine with combat experience in several theaters, ex-convict who served 30 months in the New York State prison system for manslaughter. The case apparently involved a fistfight that started in a Manhattan bar, the result of an argument over the results of a professional hockey game. I guess he won that argument, Ed Newsom said. The four of them were sitting at a table in a small room. In front of them was a glass partition, which Bill Cronin had said was one-way glass. On the other side was another wooden table, with one chair. When Cole came in, they would be able to see him, but he wouldn't be able to see them. Also, the interrogation room was mic'd. Cole's voice would carry into this room, but he wouldn't be able to hear them. Cole grew up in Philadelphia, Trudy said. Apparently, it was a game between the New York Rangers and the Philadelphia Flyers. That explains everything, Mark Swan said. Luke was silent. This was the man who was supposed to get them in to see Edwin Parr. Luke didn't mind the banter about him, but he also wanted to get to the meat of it. What is he doing here? he said. Trudy looked at the dossier. He's a former military contractor with Triple Canopy. How they hired him with his record is still an open question. It's a war zone, Newsom said. Always room for more killers. Triple Canopy let him go in February of this year, Trudy said. He has been operating in Iraq under no one's supervision for the past few months. It is possible that they released him because they discovered he was working with Parr. Why don't we know these things? Luke said. We don't talk to the contracting companies? They don't answer us? It seems like they might want to respond to inquiries from the government if they want to keep their contracts. Cole's not arrested, Trudy said. Officially, he's not here. No one has any reason to inquire about his employment history with Triple Canopy because no one has him in custody. Luke nodded. Ah, that makes sense. On the other side of the glass partition, a side door opened, and a big man walked in. He was perfectly bald. He was shirtless and wore camouflage pants and combat boots. His upper body was huge, with a massive chest and shoulders, and a neck like the stump of an oak tree. Oddly, Cole had what looked like a metal collar around his neck. He also had one black eye. It was half shut and turning various shades of purple and sickly yellow. His lower lip had been busted open on the left side. It was swollen to three or four times its normal size, and someone had been kind enough to stitch it up for him. That seemed to be the only damage he had sustained. Luke knew that Big Daddy Cronin preferred to leave the scars on the inside. Big Daddy himself followed the man in. Cole wasn't restrained in any way, and he was bigger than Cronin. Although they were about five years apart in age, Cole also seemed much younger than Big Daddy. Cole was muscle everywhere, muscles stacked on top of muscles, with hardly an ounce of fat on his body. Big Daddy was not. Have a seat, Big Daddy said. Cole sat in the chair at the table. On his left pectoral muscle near his heart was a tattoo of a Confederate flag. Well faded now, it looked like it had been bright full color at one time. Luke had also caught a glimpse of a black prison tattoo swastika on the guy's right shoulder. Luke glanced at Newsom, but Newsom made no sign he'd seen any of it. State your name, Big Daddy said. Davis Michael Cole, the man said automatically, in a deep voice. First Marines Expeditionary? Big Daddy slapped him hard across the back of his bald head. Cole flinched at the slap. Shut up, Big Daddy said. You're not in the Marines. Cole's mouth closed with a snap. Big Daddy pointed at the Confederate flag tattoo. Then he turned Cole's arm toward the window to show the swastika tattoo. 
You guys seeing this? He shook his head. He looked down at Cole and took a deep breath. You know something, Cole? You know what I'm going to tell you, right? I hate tattoos like that. I hate things like that. I hate it. It makes me hate you. No, that's not true. I don't hate you. I have a very strong urge to help you. To correct your thinking. Even if that means I have to kill you to do it. Big Daddy took a deep, slow breath. Let me ask you a question. What country's military were you supposedly in? The American military, Cole said, his voice flat and automatic. And the Confederates were what to the United States of America? Cole didn't answer. Suddenly, Big Daddy punched him in the back of the head. You better say it. He punched Cole again. Cole gritted his teeth. Then Big Daddy had a gun in his hand. It appeared there as though he was a magician, and making a gun appear was one of his easier tricks. It was a smallest thirty-eight caliber revolver, like police officers carried once upon a time. He opened the gun and slid a single bullet into a chamber. Then he closed it and gave the wheel a spin. Trudy moved as if to stand up from her seat, but Luke put a hand on her shoulder. Wait a minute, he said. Big Daddy put the gun to Cole's head. Okay. So we're going to play a little game here, he said. It's called the history game. I'll ask you a question about American history, and you answer it. Ready? Here goes. What were the Confederates? Cole closed his eyes. Big Daddy pulled the trigger. Click. Cole's entire body jerked, almost as if a bullet had gone through his head. Where are you right now, Cole? Nowhere. Big Daddy nodded. Nowhere. That's right. You're not in American custody, are you? Or anyone's custody? Cole shook his head. No. You could just die, and no one would ever know, couldn't you? Cole nodded. His entire body was shaking now. Yes. Big Daddy placed the gun against Cole's head again. So? What were the Confederates? You son of a bitch, Cole shouted, but he made no move to stand up or defend himself. Tears began to stream down his face. Big Daddy didn't seem excited, or even all that interested. He calmly pulled the trigger again. Click. Cole made a moaning sound. It's coming, Cole. It's going to be in there. I've already pulled that trigger twice. The odds are going south for you. The next chamber has the round. I can feel it. For the last time, what were the Confederates? He put the muzzle to Cole's temple. Here it comes. What were the traitors? Cole screamed. They were traitors. Traitors what? Big Daddy said. Traitors, sir, Cole said. He took a deep breath. You dumb bastard. If you were in the United States Marine Corps, like you claim, what in God's name are you doing with a flag of traitors on your chest? Cole shook his head. I don't know, sir. Big Daddy's shoulders slumped, as though he was a teacher dealing with a particularly frustrating student. He looked through the glass wall at the observers and sighed. He shrugged. It's like pulling teeth sometimes, you know that? We're not even going to get into what the Nazis were. We don't have time for that lesson today. The gun disappeared into wherever it had come from. A magic trick in reverse. Good job, Cole, Big Daddy said. The Confederates were indeed traitors to America. They were the defenders of chattel slavery. They fought against the American military and the invaded sovereign American territory. The American military defeated them and humiliated them and slaughtered them 
in a victory for the United States of America and for everything that is good and decent and right. He smacked Cole across the top of the head again. Cole barely moved this time. He was resigned to this, Luke realized. In just a few days, Cronin had made this big, fierce killer resigned to this mistreatment. Big Daddy paused for a moment. And what are you? he said. A dirtbag mercenary, Cole said. He offered that answer without any hesitation at all. Davis Cole seemed to care more about what the Confederacy was than what he himself might be. Good, Big Daddy said. What else? Cole shrugged. A pimp. A rapist. And? A disgrace to the American flag, Cole said. Big Daddy sighed again, and then smiled. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. What are you going to do tomorrow morning? Cole took a deep breath. I'm going to drive two guys into Edwin Parr's compound. Where is Parr's compound, as far as you know? When I left, it was inside El Arabi Palace in Tikrit. The place is well protected, comfortable, and I have no reason to believe he's moved during the past several days. Logistically, it would be very hard to do so, because the locals are hostile to him, and they can't reach him there. But if he leaves, Cole shrugged, he'll be up for grabs. When you get those two guys inside, what are you going to do then? I'm going to assist them in arresting Parr, or killing him, whichever the case may be. Then I'm going to help them get out again. And if you don't cooperate, or if you hesitate in carrying out your assigned tasks, or if you do anything funny at all? I'll be killed. Good. And if you try to escape? I'll be killed. What's that around your neck? Big Daddy said. Cole's big hand reached up and reflexively touched the metal collar. His fingers followed it around in a circle. It's a GPS unit, so you know where I am at all times. Very good. What else is it? It's a bomb. Trudy audibly gasped. Your friend is a psychopath, she said to Luke. Luke nodded. Big Daddy? Yeah, maybe. I think so. Big Daddy patted Cole on top of the head. Good dog. It's a small incendiary with a remote detonator, isn't it? It won't make much of an explosion. Just enough to take your head right off your shoulders. And who decides if that bomb goes off or not? You do. Now Big Daddy's grin was very wide. He looked into the mirrored window again. He put a proprietary hand on top of Cole's head. I predict that this very able combat veteran is going to make one heck of a good cooperative guide for you guys tomorrow. He will give his very life to ensure the success of the operation. This is because he knows that if the operation fails and he's somehow alive afterwards, I'm going to kill him anyway. He looked down at Cole's face. With pleasure. Chapter 12 8.45 p.m. Central European Summer Time 2.45 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time Bourg de Four Square, Old Town, Geneva, Switzerland It's happening, the text message read. The message was from his dear friend Rita Chadwick, the black sheep of a very old and very wealthy publishing family. Ahmet looked up from his flip cell phone at the action all around him. Night had come to the oldest place in Geneva. Legend had it that Romans had first built this place, and that it had been an open-air market for cattle trading. He sat at an outdoor cafe in the ancient square, nursing a cup of coffee. The night was cool, and the lights of the town, combined with the splashing of the medieval fountains and the cooing of the rich young lovers, 
made for a lovely setting. He was alone, just as he liked it. His tiny flat was a few blocks from here, along the narrow cobblestone streets of the old town. It befit the son of a banker that he lived in one of the most expensive neighborhoods in one of the most expensive cities on the planet. His name was not Ahmet, although during the past year of living here he had nearly forgotten that. He was not from Turkey, nor was he the son of a banker or anything remotely like that. He was not twenty-one years old, as his friends believed. He was twenty-five, and his youthful good looks, his high degree of physical fitness, but not muscularity, no. Muscularity was threatening, and Ahmet was anything but a threat. Combined with fantastically subtle cosmetic surgery, gave him the impression of being a younger man. Also, his friends were not his friends. He had no friends here. Or, more accurately, there were people here who thought of him as a friend. They were his friends, but he was not their friend. To Ahmet, friends were a means to an end, a form of currency. They were also a tool of war. He was here for work, and for no other reason. But he was a convincing actor, and the people around him believed he was a rich young Turk, just hanging out here in Geneva, killing time, and partying with the adult children of the global elite. No, that wasn't him. He had been placed here when it became known about a year ago that the daughter of the President of the United States would attend one year of school at the Institut Le Rosé, just twenty miles outside the city. His job was to accomplish the impossible. He was somehow to meet the girl, Elizabeth Barrett, and despite the layers of security around her, he was to charm her, seduce her, and lure her off the campus and away from her security detail. That was his entire job. Others would do the rest. He was to accomplish this without arousing suspicion or risking his cover story. Better for the operation to be a complete failure and for him to waste an entire year hanging around in clubs and shops in Geneva than to call any attention to himself. His job was to be a fisherman, cast his line, and wait to see if the fish would bite. For a long time, it seemed that it would never happen. Indeed, the entire student body and faculty of the school relocated to Gestad for three months during the winter. But Ahmet stayed here. Fishermen were not camp followers. In carrying out this task, the girl Rita had been very helpful. She was on a list he had been given early in this mission. He had targeted her, of course, and built up her trust over time. She was a rich party girl, a hedonist, and she had slept with two of Ahmet's friends, who were not his friends. She would have almost certainly slept with Ahmet, but Ahmet was a gentleman and did not think of Rita in that way. However, during a visit to the school's campus, he caught sight of Rita's friend Elizabeth. She is so beautiful. I must meet her. Who is she? Oh, Rita said, I'm afraid she's out of your reach, lover boy. She can't be out of my reach. Who is she? She's Elizabeth Barrett. Ahmet made a face showing his confusion. The name meant nothing to him. A celebrity of some kind in your country? Rita nodded. You might say that. She's the daughter of the president. Still, if I can meet her uh, somewhere quiet where we can talk, maybe she would like me. I think she'll fall head over heels for you. But you'd have to pry her out of the grip of the Secret Service. I might have some ideas about that. Over time, he and Rita had concocted a plan. Rita would help Elizabeth escape the clutches of the school and her security detail for just one night. One night of fun, one night of talk and dancing and laughter. Ahmet and Elizabeth would get this one chance to meet, away from the prying eyes of the world. But time passed, and the school year was coming to a close. Soon the students would all leave for their next carefully scripted and curated adventures. 
it seemed that young Elizabeth was not brave enough to carry out the plan. And that was where everything stood, in a holding pattern, until this very moment. He took a deep breath and remained calm. Escape mode? He typed into his phone and pressed send. He sipped his coffee and gazed out at the people in light jackets walking arm in arm through the square. A few moments passed. Then his phone beeped with a reply. Yes. For several minutes he stared down at that word. His breath seemed to have caught in his throat. Was it even possible? I don't believe it. When? An eternity passed before Rita wrote him again. Believe it or not, tomorrow night. Ahmed felt his heart beating in his chest. Tomorrow night was very soon. His handlers had long ago become skeptical of his ability to carry out this operation. Now they would have to overcome their skepticism. They needed to act fast. Men needed to be brought into the city from far-flung places. Of course there was a plan. Of course there was a plan. There had always been a plan. But the plan had to be set in motion immediately, practically this instant. He knocked back the last of his coffee and threw some money on the table. Then he was up and moving through the square toward his flat. He had to get a coded message out and hope that they would act in time. He also had to hope against hope that Rita was correct, and beautiful Elizabeth really was planning to make her escape. He typed into his phone as he walked. I'm very excited.